who at the ages of 22 and 23 left the comfort and security of their homes in Sweden for the new world. They traveled by steamship and then by railroad halfway across a strange land whose language they did not understand to Minneapolis. This is their story as remembered by their three grandchildren. We have put together this piece on our grandparents and their three daughters who lived at 1816 Third Street South in Minneapolis during the period when electricity and the automobile were just coming on the scene. We deeply regret not asking them more questions when we were children, so we had to work around many unanswered questions. This is John Larson's Swedish passport. Note it was issued on April 4, 1881, when he was 22 years old. John Larson was a large, raw-boned man. He was bow-legged and walked with a rolling gait. His feet were so big he had to have special-made shoes. Her mother had to make his big shirts. His walrus mustache always had a brown tobacco stain. This was his mustache cup. Note his large hands compared to Hannah's. Helen thinks he broke his wrist playing baseball, but Glenn thinks a horse stepped on them. His friends tried to set them, but they never healed properly. Note the wrist bone. The records show him as a teamster and laborer city engineer. John Larson sent for his sweetheart six months after he arrived in Minneapolis. This is Hannah Old's daughter's Swedish passport. It was issued October 18, 1881, when she was 23 years old. The Swedish method of selecting a last name is interesting. John's father's first name was Lars, so John's last name was Lars's son. The second S was dropped over here. Anna's father's first name was Oli, so she was named Oli's daughter. Sweden is trying to discourage this confusing system, so they have published a list of recommended last names. Caroline, the oldest child, was born in 1883. This is a beautiful picture of her. Unfortunately, she died at the age of 30 of tuberculosis, which was very common in those days. Louise, born in 1886, never married. She worked in the cafeteria of Chevron Hall on the University of Minnesota campus. Summer, she worked at Glazer Park. Edvig, our mother, was the youngest of the children. She was born in 1889. When our aunts Carolyn and Louise enrolled our mother in school, they were embarrassed with her name. So they enrolled her as Gina Larson. This is her graduation picture from the eighth grade. She was 16 at the time. This was the end of their formal education. They were expected to find a job and help support the family. the floor plan of the house as we remember it. We believe they moved in in 1909 or 1910. The building permit for the house was issued June 21, 1892. The shed permit May 2, 1904. The gas lights July 21, 1908. And the electricity September 28, 1923. It had an open front porch as shown in this photograph. They rented the lower floor. There was a second rental unit on the second floor. The unheated parlor was only used for social occasions and closed off during the winter. Occasionally, Glenn was allowed into the parlor to play the Victrola phonograph carefully. This is our grandparents sitting on the love seat in the parlor. This is their desk bookcase that currently sports a new paint job. The dining room had a coal fire stove. Ellen recalls having her pajamas and pillow warmed on this stove. Grandpa would put a can of turpentine on the stove if we had a cold. I remember sleeping on this day bed. This was my grandmother's bedroom. The long, narrow bathroom, painted a hideous dark green, contained only the toilet. There was no wash basin or bathtub. The kitchen was the center of most activity. There was a simple sink with only one cold water faucet. This was the ice box with the water collecting pan underneath it. 
This was the coal-fired range used for cooking and heat water. This little curtain stand had my grandfather's home room behind the curtain. I remember when a bottle exploded and my grandfather came rushing out of his bedroom in long underwear and swearing in Swedish. I used to keep the beer bottles for him. There was a large stain on the ceiling over the sink made by the beer when he opened a bottle. My grandma was afraid the minister would see it when he came for coffee. Helen recalls Grandpa made us clean our dinner plates, so one time Ruth Sandberg threw her fishbone under the table so her plate would be clean. During the Christmas holidays, I would help my grandmother make head cheese from a pig's head. The wash tub, scrub board, and hand wringer were kept on this closed porch. This is the woodshed where my grandfather made toys for us, even with his huge crippled hands. This is Helen's dollhouse and furniture. At Christmas, he would buy the worst tree he could find, cut all the branches off, and fill no holes for them. He would end up with a beautiful tree. There was no radio and limited movies, so for self-entertainment, the teenage girls formed a social club of about 15 members that met one evening a week at someone's home. Olga Bergeson was the secretary. This is our Aunt Louise, and this is our Aunt Carolyn. Her mother joined at the age of 16. Two volumes of the Ivy Club Minutes still exist. The minutes give a real insight into what life was like for these young women. The clubs formed the evening of November 13, 1905. The meetings were held once a week at the various members' homes for playing cards, sewing, and socializing. There was also musical entertainment and light refreshments. The weekly news was five cents, and you were fined ten cents if you failed to bring sewing. There are frequent references to the teacher, who was a skilled seamstress that taught the girls new stitches. If you didn't have your bonnet on by 11 o'clock, you had to leave it, according to the minutes. At the second meeting, they accepted my mother's recommendation of Ivy as the name of the club. She was 16. They selected Old Rose and Olive Green as the club colors. A committee purchased the ribbon and made badges for the members. Their lifespan was short, and there were frequent references to sick members. A sick committee was formed to visit the sick members and bring them flowers. Toward the end of the evening, they would have a flower march, led by the club officers, accompanied by music, to drop pennies into a basket for the flowers. One night they discovered a button in the basket, so selected a detective to watch the basket. Our Aunt Louise hosted the December 11, 1905 meeting. The secretary noted that since no musical instruments were found, they sang Marching Through Georgia during the Flower March. At the Decoration Day meeting in 1907, the secretary noted that most enjoyed a ride in an automobile. The neighborhood was probably the heart of the Swedish community. The immigrants would head for this area where they would find relatives or friends from the same town in Sweden. Cedar Avenue was called Snus Boulevard. Snus is a Swedish word for snuff that they all chewed and spit on the street. Pillsbury House had a summer camp near Waconia that I attended. It cost $5 for two weeks, including the train fare. This shows the house behind 1860 that I was told was occupied by a gypsy fortune teller. There was a livery stable next door, and note the tall brick buildings along Cedar Avenue. My grandfather had a team of horses. I think they were used for hauling dirt. My mother told me that after getting paid Friday, he'd go to this saloon and get roaring drunk. The saloon keeper would pour him onto the wagon and unhitch the horses. They would head home. The girls would unhitch the horses and haul their dad into the house. Helen recalls that on Saturday night we would first go to Grandpa's. We then up to the Salvation Army at Sixth and Cedar. We would march behind the band up to Seven Corners. My favorite store was the German Holzerman's dry goods store. We would descend rickety wooden stairs into the dark basement that was filled with cuckoo clocks, Christmas paints, and other beautiful wood carvings from the German black forest. There was the distinctive odor in that gloomy basement. Dania Hall on Snus Boulevard, which recently burned down, was a social center on Saturday night. 
Note the three-story brick buildings along Tura Avenue. 